Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. We're carrying on with the Hawkmoon series here with the second book, The Mad God's Amulet. As with the first book, I'm using art from the graphic novel to illustrate the events of the book, because they, well, they share the same plot. I'm not reviewing the comic exactly. I'm not going to be talking about the art or that sort of thing. My mental picture of events was different from the one that the artist had, but that's okay. That's what makes books great. So, however, they share a common plot, so it's still kind of, it's, it's, it's still kind of a review-ish of the comic in terms of the plot structure, and I'll let you draw your own conclusions about the art and that sort of stuff. Anyway, enough of my jibber-jabber, let's get started. Previously in the Chronicles of the Rune stuff, Duke Dorian Hockmoon Van Kohn was captured by the forces of the Dark Empire of Grand Bretagne after his lands were conquered and had a black jewel implanted in his skull that let the forces of the Dark Empire see through the gem and to kill Hockmoon whenever they pleased or should he engage in treachery. Hockmoon was then sent to Castle Brass, which had resisted the entreaties of the Dark Empire's ambassador, Baron Melanatus, to betray their defenses, to kill Count Brass, and to kidnap the daughter of Count Brass, for the Baron to take as his own. Instead, Count Brass saw through the deception of the Dark Empire and released their hold on Hawkmoon. However, this release was only temporary. After Hawkmoon and Count Brass rebuffed the forces of the Dark Empire, Hawkmoon set out for the city of Hamadan, there to find the sorcerer Malagigi, who could permanently disable the gem. On the way to Hamadan, Hawkmoon found the half-giant Oladan, who joins him in his journey. Together, they fought a evil sorcerer and then finally reached Hamadan and there found the city and its ruler, Queen Frabra, under attack by the forces of her brother and his allies from the Dark Empire, also led by Malinatus. Hawkmoon and Olajan, Oladan joined in the fight, along with the mysterious warrior in Jet and Gold, who knows Hawkmoon's secret destiny as the champion of the Rune Staff, and an aspect of the Champion Eternal, protector of the balance between law and chaos. They rebuff the attackers and defeat Melanatus, and the power of the Black Jewel is disabled, although Hawkmoon keeps it installed in his skull as a reminder of the Dark Empire's treachery. The book begins not long after the events of the Jewel and the Skull. Hawkmoon and Oladon are attempting to make their way back to Camarg in an attempt to avoid the forces of the Dark Empire in Europe, they are attempting to make their way across the top of North Africa, perhaps not realizing that this route would take them along the edge of the Sahara Desert. Whoops! While traveling this route, they end up getting somewhat lost, but manage to seek shelter in the seemingly abandoned city of Soriandum, only to discover it's not quite so abandoned. Several ornithopters from the Dark Empire are there, commanded by Huliam de Aver a French collaborator with the force of the Dark Empire who has come there to explore the city, but ends up capturing Hawkmoon in the process. As they languish in a cell, waiting to be executed, Hawkmoon and Oladan are contacted by the inhabitants of the city, who do in fact still exist, but they have rendered themselves incorporeal and wish to remove themselves and their city, which they are bound to, from this plane of existence and need Hawkmoon's help to do it. They will release Hawkmoon and his friend, provided they retrieve two devices from a complex nearby, which will let them remove the city from this reality. The Hawk inhabitants only need one, and if Hawkmoon can get, can get both, then he can keep it. Hawkmoon and Oladon make their way to this complex, and manage to get both devices, in the process releasing the complex's guardian, which in turn attacks the Dark Empire soldiers, after our heroes invade them, that is. The residents of Soriandum activate their device, moving their city into limbo, as the warriors of Grand Bretagne fight the Guardian. Hawkmoon and Oladon backtrack and continue through the Middle East, eventually ending up on the Black Sea, headed for Ankara, presumably realizing that traveling the North Sahara was a really dumb idea, and maybe going through Europe was generally better and safer after all. While they are en route, Hawkmoon and Oladon's ship encounters De Vere, a drift on the water, and they rescue him from certain death. Later, they face a ship crewed by insane raiders, the followers of the Mad God. After defeating them and taking their ship, 
Devere decides to throw in his lot with Hawkmoon, and Hawkmoon decides to go after the leader of the cult of the Mad God after finding the ring of Count Brass's daughter and Hawkmoon's love, Isilda, in the cultist's possession. Now, seriously, Michael Moorcock, while he does set up the romance between Hawkmoon and Isilda in the first book, he spends more time on Hawkmoon pining for Isilda than on the two of them together doing romantic -y things. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's a situation where Moorcock thinks, oh, the romance part slows down the pacing of the story, or if Moorcock realizes, oh, I'm not very good at writing romance, and so I'm just going to play downplay the actual people on screen, on screen together doing romantic stuff and leave that off camera and leave it to the audience's imagination. And, if so, actually props to him on that. That's something that George Lucas could have learned from writing the prequels. Our heroes seek out the cult of the Mad God, and in the process are rejoined by the warrior in Jet and Gold. The warrior tells them that the power of the cult of the Mad God comes from the Red Amulet, which is in the cult leader's possession, and that it is Hawkmoon's destiny as a champion of the Rune Staff to retrieve it. They reach the castle and find themselves attacked by beautiful women who have had a mind whammy put on them by the leader of the cult, Stalnikov. They manage to knock the women out without killing or maiming them and make their way to Stalnikov himself. They kill him and rescue Isilda. As our heroes prepare to escape and return home, they discover the fort surrounded by soldiers of the Dark Empire, and they fight their way through using some magically augmented giant cats who help them fight, and who are also willing to be attached to a cart, so long as they're commanded by the welder of the amulet. Hawkmoon also learns that, as he's the chosen champion of the rune staff, he is able to call upon the power of the amulet to give him strength in battle, without being driven mad, as Daunikov was. In the process, though, our heroes are separated from the warrior. The party decides to disguise themselves as soldiers of Grand Britain, as all Grand Britannian soldiers wear masks, and with some adventures, they make their way through a camp of the armies of the Dark Empire, which are led by Baron Melanotis, who has managed to escape after his defeat in the last book. Our heroes reach Camargue and rejoin the ailing Count Brass, who was wounded in battle and has started to give up hope of life after the loss of his daughter and of Hawkmoon. On being reunited, Count Brass regains his strength, and the forces of Castle Brass manage to push back the Dark Empire's forces far enough that the device Hawkmoon brought with him can be activated, and Castle Brass is shifted to another plane of existence, frustrating Baron Melanotis once again. Like the first book in the series, this is a darn good story. Unlike the first book, though, this feels like a semi-serialized TV series, in the sense that it's somewhat episodic in that there are vine there's chapters or sections or little arcs of the story which don't necessarily connect to each other in broad strokes, more connect in terms of small beats, like, for example, Hawkmoon and Oladon going to Soriandrium. It, the only thing that keeps that from being completely extraneous to the plot is the crystal device that Hawkmoon gets and meeting Dever. So, by the, so it, it serves a purpose, but... A lot of this other stuff that happens there, like the cat creature, like the um, cat constructs and that sort of thing, don't really show up anywhere else. Not only cat constructs, guardian constructs. You know what I mean. Those don't really show up anywhere else in the story, or even any of the later works. And in fact, the people of Soriangi aren't discussed much. It's just more their technology, the, the crystal that comes up later. Also, um... Unlike the second book in the Season Flight series, though, this tells an interesting story on its own. It's not totally self-contained in the sense that there's the matter of the grudge between Melandius or Melanotus and Hawkmoon from the first book and the sort of ongoing resistance between the Dark Empire and Castle Brass. That stuff still... It's kind of, if you've read the first book, it makes more sense and you understand it better. But it does enough with, for example, the blurbs from the 
history of the rune stuff at the beginning of the book, that it makes it fairly straightforward to come in here if you skip the first one. So I definitely recommend this book. I would recommend reading the first book first, but if you happen to pick up this book on its own and you haven't read the first volume, you're doing okay. You're not missing out on too much. It, it You should still go back and read the first one, but you're safe. You're not going to go, oh, I have no idea who these people are. You'll kind of understand, have a bit of, I don't know who these people are, but they, they do a good job of making it easy for new people. So, next time, we'll go on to book three, The Sword of the Dawn, and I'll see you then. Thank <laughs> you.